The next time you tell me that your all-wheel drive car can send 100% of its power to such and such axle, I'm sending my army to your house. And since I don't actually have an army, that's an empty promise. Just as empty as the promise the salesman made to you when he sold you that Haldex piece of crap. All-wheel drive systems are not created equally. They have fundamental differences in how they work that have profound effects on how they make the cars handle under power and at the limit. Before you start throwing around claims about where the engine can send its power, you need to understand what type of all-wheel drive system you have and how it works. There are three main types of all-wheel drive systems in use today. The first of those is the user-selectable four-wheel drive system. These are like the things you'd see on pickup trucks. These cars are either in two-wheel drive mode, or bear with me because this is very complicated stuff, in four-wheel drive mode. In two-wheel drive mode, they're either front or rear-wheel drive, as they normally are. In four-wheel drive, they nominally send power to each of the four wheels equally. If they have open differentials, the power actually goes to the wheel with the least amount of traction. If your all-wheel drive system has three locking differentials, like say the Mercedes-Benz G-Class, well then it can actually send 100% of its power to one wheel, provided the other three wheels are completely in the air. And I dare you to try this. Like, please actually send me the video. Thing is, with lock differentials, a car cannot go around a corner. I'm not even talking about handling. I mean the car actually can't turn in the first place. If you unlock some or all of those diffs, it's better. It'll go around a corner, but it'll understeer. Horribly. Ask Michel Mouton. Audi's original Quattro is that second type of all-wheel drive system. It behaves just like the user selectable one, except that it's in all-wheel drive all the time, sends power to all four wheels. And just like that first type of all-wheel drive, adding power at the limit around a corner just induces understeer. And this is why the original Quattro cars were so hard to drive at the limit. The rally drivers would have to flick the car to get it sideways and then add power to help pull it straight again. And if they added too much, they would just understeer right off the track. Anyway, it's the third type of all-wheel drive system that I want to talk about. And these are the ones where the cars start out as two-wheel drive cars, but the computer can fade in all-wheel drive as necessary. In this group, there are those that start out as front-wheel drive cars, and this is the Haldex type system that Volvo and Volkswagen uses. And in these systems, the front wheels are permanently connected to the engine. There is a center differential clutch pack that the computer can squeeze to gradually lock the front and rear axles together, giving the car all-wheel drive. But the key point here is that the front wheels are always driven. So at best, this is a 100% front-wheel drive car, and with the clutch pack locked, it's 50-50. Sorry to say, your rear wheels are never getting 100% of the engine's torque unless your front wheels are completely off the ground. And while this happens occasionally in rental cars, I've never driven a Haldex car powerful enough to keep that wheelie going. I've also never driven a Haldex car that's any good at the limit. And that's because at worst, it's a front wheel drive car that understeers. And at best, it's an all wheel drive car that understeers. The second version of this type of all-wheel drive system is based on a rear-wheel drive car, and this is the type of system that BMW and Jaguar uses. At rest, this is a rear-wheel drive system that can always power its rear wheels, but if the computer wants, it can squeeze the clutch pack and send some of that power to the front. BMW has never boasted that its system can send 100% of its power to the front wheels because A, it can't, and B, no one would ever want that ever. Do you see why Volkswagens can't send 100% of their power to the back? It's the same thing, just in reverse. The big difference here is that in terms of handling, this is a rear wheel drive car until the computer decides to send some power forward. So you get the benefits of a rear wheel drive car under power, meaning you stab the throttle, you get the car sideways, and then you can keep your foot in it because the computer will start to send power to the front wheels, holding that drift forever. This is the best of both worlds. If you ever wanna see this principle in action, go and drive like a maniac in an Audi SQ5 and a Porsche Macan back to back. These two are the same basic trucks, but they have very different all wheel drive systems. The Porsche sends its power to the back at all times, unless the computer wants to send some forward, meaning it handles like a Porsche. Stab the gas, it throws itself sideways, fades some power forward and helps you hold these amazing drifts. The Audi, on the other hand, always powers the front wheels and can send some of that to the back wheels if it deems necessary. So it either understeers or understeers. 
Here's the thing, everything I've talked about thus far is limit handling. All of these cars with four wheel drive systems can drive all four wheels, which means they will get you out of a snowbank once you've understeered or oversteered into it. Either way, you're fine. But I don't care about getting your car out of snow. I'm talking about limit handling here. And there is one trick where you can get rid of that understeer problem for the front wheel drive based cars, and that's to overdrive the rear wheels. Simply put, you can choose a slightly longer gear ratio for the rear wheels than the front, so that, for example, every time the front wheel tries to make one turn, the rear wheels go 1.05 turns. That way, you can actually send more than half of the torque to the rear wheels, and there have been some amazing all-wheel drive systems made like this, like Honda's Super Handling All-Wheel Drive, the Mitsubishi Evo system, and the Ford Focus RS's all-wheel drive system. They can actually start to act like a rear drive car, kicking the tail out under power. But think about it. If the rear wheels turn 1.05 times for every time the front wheel turns once, well, the car is going to collapse in itself. That's not gonna work. Something's gotta give, and that something is the center clutch pack, which is gonna slip. If the center clutch pack is slipping, it's creating heat. And if it's creating heat, it's going to overheat. So this whole thing can only last for so long. This is a temporary band-aid on an understeering bullet wound. The lesson here is that you're never gonna distance yourself from what you are. Golf R boy, own it. You drive a front wheel drive car. It's never gonna rotate under power, and it's certainly never gonna send 100% of the power to the rear. Unless you jump it, land on the rear wheels, keep your foot in it, and keep that wheelie going, and please, in that case, send me the video. Just address it to the know-it-all.